If you've watched this channel for long enough, you will know that I have a long-standing passion for fixed gear bikes. And today I'm going to talk you through two very different takes on my obsession. I'm gonna start things off with my state undefeated hill climb fixed gear, which weighs not a lot. And then I'm gonna talk you through my surly steamroller fixed gear flat bar gravel idiot wagon. Now in this video, I'm gonna start off by talking about what a fixed gear bike is and what the purported benefits are. And then I'm gonna talk you through the builds and what I do and don't like about both of these bikes. But as always, if you have any questions about the bikes, my fashionable fashion choices, my beautiful South Bristol home, anything at all, leave those in the comments and don't forget to like, subscribe and click that little bell icon. So every time we upload a video, you'll get a notification. Now to start things off, for those of you that don't know, a fixed gear bike is a single speed bike, by which I mean a bike without multiple gears, which cannot freewheel. In short, this means that if the bike is moving and the wheels are moving, the crank set is moving. So you have to pedal at all times when you're on a fixed gear bike. Now for those of you that haven't ridden a fixed gear bike before, it's very, very fair to ask why you would choose to do so. On descents, you're gonna spin like an idiot, and on climbs, you're gonna mash your knees into a horrible oblivion. Well, there's some kind of myths and rumors about what makes fixed gears good, but for me, they're fun. I really, really enjoy riding them. They bring a novel challenge to my riding and they're weirdly addictive. And that's really what it boils down to for me. It's nothing to do with training, they're just fun. Now, as I mentioned, we're gonna talk through two very different bikes, starting with the State Undefeated. Not the deflated, that was just modified by some of my friends to better reflect my riding ability. Now, if you've been watching this channel for long enough, you will recognize this bike from the last couple of seasons of Hill Climb Diaries. And if you haven't watched those, please do with some of the best things we've ever made. There's a link in the video description. Now, I first built this bike up in 2018 and I managed to get it down to a pretty reasonable 6.8 kilograms. But in its current guise, without pedals to be fair, this bike weighs 5.43 kilos, and that is very light. Now, weight alone isn't everything when it comes to hill climbs. On longer or more changeable courses, you do have to take into account the aerodynamics of your bike and yourself. It will make a bigger difference than weight in some cases. However, here in the UK, hill climb events typically range in the kind of five to at very most 15 minute range. And often they might be even shorter than that, up a very short, steep and quite consistent gradient. That means that if weight is your primary concern and you like riding them, you can get your gearing just right on a fixie. And when you do get it just right, there is no better feeling. On the other hand, if you get the gearing wrong, which is an excuse you can always fall back on, if you have a substandard performance on the day, you can always blame the bike. Now, it might seem like a weird thing to start on, but the crank set is actually one of the highlights for me. If you know your fixies, you'll know that a road crank set, which this SRAM S950 crank set is, they don't have the correct chain line typically for fixed gear bikes. For those of you that don't know, the chain line is essentially the measurement from the middle of your bike, or the middle of the bottom bracket shell, or the rear axle, to the cog or the chain ring. And with a fixed gear bike, you need to basically match those numbers up. So the chain line of the crank set and the chain line of the rear hub have to be the same. Now to give you some context, and I am gonna to refer to my notes here, this crank set, for example, had a chain line of 47.3 millimeters. So if I was to use this with a regular road chain ring, the chain line would be massively off and you basically wouldn't be able to use it. However, in a stroke of sheer genius, it occurred to me that I had a one by gravel Kinesis chain ring designed for these SRAM direct mount cranks sitting in my shed. Now these chain rings give a minus six millimeter offset so they can work better with road cranks and then your more typical one by cassette. Now, with that minus six millimeter offset, it brought the chain line down to 41.3 millimeters. And the particular hubs here, the Mac hubs, they have a 41 millimeter chain line. 0.3 of a millimeter means nothing and it works so smoothly. Compared to the Omniums they replaced, these chain rings are a good deal lighter, and because they use that direct mount pattern, it means that I can get much smaller chain rings compared to a track chain set. As you see here, 
This has got a 46 tooth chain ring on it currently, and I think it's matched with like a 15 tooth at back. That is far too big for any hill climb whatsoever, but I actually had this set up for a stupid time trial I did a couple weeks ago. Now, just before we finish, I kind of want to talk quickly about that rear cog. I use a Miche, or maybe Miche, I'm very sorry to the Italians, a carrier cog system, which really speeds up and makes it way less stressful to change cogs before an event. Now, with a typical fixed gear cog, you screw it straight onto the hub and then you have a reverse threaded lock ring, which stops it from unscrewing. With this system, it's ever so slightly different where you screw on this kind of flanged carrier and it's got notches all around the edge of that which mate with these specially designed cogs, which slide on. And then your typical lock ring holds everything in place. Now this is way easier to use than a typical screw on cog. And in my experience, it actually feels completely fine. I've got a full range of cogs for this bike. I think I've got everything from like 14 teeth up to 18. So that gives me more than enough range for the rear. And then, like I said, when the time comes, I'll be getting a much smaller chain ring for hill climbs. Now onto the wheel set, and this is very, very premium. Now these wheels are built around a set of Mac super light hubs, and these are generally believed to be the lightest fixed gear hubs you can get out there, and they are properly light. They're then paired with a set of Yishin bike tubular rims, and when paired with perilously low spoke counts, you get a truly lightweight set of wheels, coming in at well under a thousand grams. Now, there's no good building, a set of lightweight wheels and shodding them with a set of Schwalbe Marathon Pluses. So of course we have some very silly Continental Pro TT tyres in a 22mm width. Now there's some potential advantages to going with a wider tyre, particularly on rougher roads as we find here in the UK, but in terms of the pursuit of all-out lightness, they don't come much lighter than this. Now onto the finishing kit and I actually recently updated this compared to the original build from 2018. Now starting with the saddle, we have a Pro Stealth Superlight. The Pro Stealth is my all-time favourite saddle ever. In fact, I loved it so much, I wrote a love letter to it, which I published on Bike Radar recently, and you can check that out in the link in the video description. To be totally fair, I could have gone for a lighter saddle, but believe it or not, I actually do some longer rides on this bike, and I would like to have children one day, so I have gone for a padded saddle, so... That's my one concession to heavyweight on this bike. This is matched with a Pro Vibe inline carbon seat post. The stem is another real highlight of this build, and this is an extra light stem in 120 millimeter length, and it weighs just 88 grams, which is frankly insane for an alloy stem. It is a little bit terrifying to fit. It uses T20 heads, which, I mean, who has those on your toolkit, but never mind and the maximum torque on both the stem clamps and the face plates is three newton meters. Do not touch this unless you have a well calibrated torque wrench. Now onto the bars themselves. These are one of the more divisive parts of the build and they are Profile's Svet TT base bar. On hill climbs, you never use the drops on a typical drop bar. So it's pretty common to see people chopping these straight off. Whereas with a base bar, well, you pretty much have that already. And these, the Profile Svet TT, are pretty damn light, coming in, if I remember correctly, at about 200 grams. As I don't need to worry about shifters, because it's a stupid fixie, I simply have a little 3T clamp-on bar end brake lever. It's not the best feeling thing in the world, it's a little bit floppy, but it's more than enough, and more critically than anything else, it's damn light. Now on a rim brake bike, the brakes themselves are one of these places you can really look to save a ton of weight. And on this bike, we have a Cane Creek EE brake. You will have seen them previously on the channel. Joe had them, the direct mount version on his old Monda, and I've used them for a couple of seasons now on this. And again, I cannot stress enough, they are very good brakes and really light. Now that's the build. And let me tell you, all of that adds up to a bike, which is an absolute hoot to ride. The undefeated frame set is based on a 7000 series and unbelievably stiff alloy tube set. The front end as well, despite the fork being stupidly light, is also incredibly stiff, so you don't feel like you're getting that weird splaying fore and aft. A super stiff frame set isn't necessarily everything you want in a bike, but for a hill climb bike, if you're basing it on feel alone, it's so much fun. You feel like you're giving up nothing to the frame set, you're putting every bit of power down onto the road, and again, it's so much fun. 
I have had some truly sad moments on this bike when I've got the gearing wrong, but when you get it right, there's no better feeling. And I will be riding all of my hill climbs on bikes like this for many years to come. And now we move away from something totally uncompromising to something that compromises in no way in aiming to be the stupidest bike that I own. As if by magic, the bike has changed and the sun outside has made a very unwelcome appearance, ruining any continuity between those two shots, but never mind. So earlier this year, I was asked what my all-time favourite bikes were. And if you remember, number one was my stupid tandem Cecil, but closely behind was the Surly Steamroller. So as a basic premise, and this makes no sense whatsoever to those of you who have not ridden one off-road, but with this bike, I wanted to make a flat bar, thick gear, gravel, rim brake, odd axi, skid, fun bike. And that's exactly what this has turned out as. As with all of Surly's bikes, you can fit truly wide tyres onto this bike. And although I think it's only officially rated to 35mm tyres, I have easily put in far larger. And for a time, I was running WTB Rattler tyres at 40mm width. I slimmed them down a little bit after that, down to these 36mm WTB Exposure tyres. Again, one of my favourite all-time tyres. And I did that for a really stupid ride I did on this bike, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Safe to say, in all of its guises, I have had these wheels set up tubeless. I think I must be one of only 10 people in the world with a fixed gear tubeless rim brake gravel wheel set, but there you have it. And these are based on Halo's long-standing track hubs, and that is also laced to their Evura tubeless rim brake rims. This wheel set, I kind of went for a bit of a belt and braces approach, and they're just 32 spoke, three cross, really classic looking, and more than that, super strong, which is important because when you're riding a fixed gear bike off-road with only one brake and you're hurtling towards a big massive patch of roots, plowing into it is often the only option. So a good sturdy wheel set is definitely important. Looking at the gearing, there's nothing quite as interesting as the state, but in terms of gearing, because I know somebody will ask the question, I tend to run a 48 tooth chainring with a 20 tooth cog out back for nearly all terrain. With this gear, I can get up all but the very steepest of climbs, and it's only when it comes to really, really fast ascents that it's that uncomfortable. But for rolling, kind of gentle terrain, it's honestly fine for the majority of cases. The handlebars definitely help here. Now these are just a set of bog standard alloy specialized bars, which were originally 800 millimeters wide. I rode the bike up and down that road once with the bars 800 millimeters wide and immediately cut them down to 760 mil because it felt terrible with them that wide. 760 mil is still fairly wide for what is essentially a gravel bike, but it gives you that little bit more leverage and a bit more comfort when you're climbing off road. Also, I can always move my hands inboard if I'm uncomfortable with them that wide for whatever reason. Now I mentioned a minute ago that I did a really stupid ride on this bike a couple months ago. Now this was a bit of a long-term goal of mine, and in this ride I rode from Bristol, where we're based, all the way down to the Isle of Portland on the south coast of England. And then I rode back in the same day. And that clocked up to a ride that was just under 278 kilometers in the day on the stupid bike. So for that day, I made possibly the ugliest cockpit of all time, pairing 760 mil wide mountain bike handlebars with the extensions from a time trial bike. It blew up Instagram. I couldn't believe how much I upset people with a simple cockpit setup. And I am not ashamed to say it was excellent. You get that massive aero advantage being in the extensions, but then when you come to rougher terrain or climbing, you can still climb really comfortably with a flat bar. I'm so convinced that this is a good setup that I think if I was doing something like maybe like the transatlantic way, like Felix did, I would genuinely consider going for a flat bar with the aero extensions. Hold me to it if I ever do a stupid challenge like that, and do let me know if you'd like to see a video from that day. Looking elsewhere at the cockpit, we have Paul Components' Love Lever Brake Lever. These are almost comically well made with incredibly tight tolerances and dual row cartridge bearings, which mean there's no slop up or down with the lever. They feel so taut and so stiff and like I cannot stress how much, funnily enough, I love the love lever. Now that lever controls the racer medium brake also from Paul Components. 
Now this is a center pull brake, so that's why we have a little cable hanger here. Center pull brakes have some slight advantages compared to a typical side pull caliper. You get much larger clearances and I would argue the feel at the lever is a little bit better compared to a side pull brake. There's a bit more modulation, they feel very powerful, although that might have something to do with the particular construction of this brake, but really it is the clearances which are important on this bike. Rounding out the finishing kit, we have the same saddle that we saw on the State, and that is again the Pro Stealth Superlight. It's, it's taken me a long time to find a saddle I love this much, and I'm happy that it's finally come into my life. Finally, we have these beautiful splatter pink bottle cages. These are from Elite, and you're not going to be able to get them because they are vintage. I picked these up in a charity shop a couple of years ago, and I was waiting for just the right build to put them on, and this was finally it. In terms of the ride quality, this bike for the last, well since lockdown started, so since March, has been my absolute go-to. It is a hoot. On the local gravel trails, it has encouraged me to try out new stupid diversions, go down dodgy dogging paths and try absolutely everything in between. It brings otherwise boring, well-known trails into a totally new light and brings, again, new challenges to boring terrain. Lastly, throughout the last couple of months, it's given me ample opportunity to practice my skids and I can throw down some big fat ones in the gravel these days, particularly with these lovely slick tires. It should come as no surprise, but it's clear I love both of these bikes for very different reasons and they are very different bikes. But the one thing that ties them together again is that fixed gear drivetrain. Fixies, if you shop around canly enough and you keep your eye on the likes of eBay, can be really cheap to build. If you're looking for a new challenge in your riding, or you just want something fun to play with and mess around with, Fixies come highly recommended. They'll bring a unique take into your riding life, and you never know, you might become as addicted to them as me. I think I've waffled on for long enough now, and I should be clear, I love these bikes, and I want to know what you think about them in the comments. Do you think they're stupid? Fair enough if you do. Do you think they're really cool? I'm glad you're on board. By all means, please leave those thoughts in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe. And click that little bell icon so every time we upload a video like this, you'll get a notification.